general public is of a drastically bifurcated nature. There's this side of things and there's this side of things and you're either on one side or you're on the other and it's like pro wrestling it's like you know in in the liberal camp the the conservatives are the evil villains you know they're they're like the uh, the foreign menace on the conservative end the liberal you know those are the villains that that are just letting the world fall to pieces and the 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 the, the reporting on this has become so unbalanced that it's very harmful, I think. You're not allowing kids to think. You're, you're scaring them with uh, biased sound bites. Um, you're, you're, you're putting on this political theater that we mistake for the world happening and, and government doing what government does. Uh, if what we're getting fed is what government really does, I think that the entire country would would <laughs> would have fallen apart by now. It's it's it's. Um, we're getting taken for a ride by the way that media covers current events, and I just wish that we had more philosophers in power uh, as programming directors at uh, radio stations and or television stations or streaming uh, services or uh, web-based shows because if you could demand that you guys don't get to talk about these very important things unless you present a balanced um, uh, display of the facts of, of of the real information of both sides of the story until we get that back from what it's become it's my opinion that something like this this podcast um, I say this every time I'm interviewed now I believe podcasts are saving journalism from the brink of the abyss I think journalism's uh, journalism has become a cesspool of biased sound bites and BS and I think that uh, the ability for two people to sit in a room and have an hour-long conversation where there's, you know, I'm very long-winded, as you can tell. Mm-hmm. I've had all the time in, in the world that I can make my points the way I want to make them. Right. You have all the time in the world to respond. We have to bring this back in our culture. Otherwise, you're going to be raising a gang of idiots for the next generation who only know one drastic side or the other. So that, that's that been on my mind lately. Well, a lot, a lot of the problem is that people don't listen anymore. They wait to be able to ask a question. They sure and do. I see that with interviewers all the time. And that's why we do the after show. It's so because while I'm talking during the show, there'll be something pop in my head, but I don't want to cut you off, you know. So in the after show we go into that stuff. But I see so many people just want to push their questions out. And I don't think you're old enough to remember Charles Corral. Uh but he did some of the best journal he was he was journalist for uh CPS at the time. He did Every, he did everything well, uh, but he just didn't have the stomach. And he said, I don't have the stomach for uh, war correspondence, stuff like that. And he did all this all this stuff great, and uh, and he was flying a story, and he said, um, he said to his producer, he said, he looked out the window of the plane, he said, look at those lights down there. He said, that's the real country. That's what we're not reporting on. We're only reporting on the tragedy, and I'm thinking. He said, and he, he came outside. And he said, "What if I got one? Of, what if I got one of those new Winnebagos, mm-hmm. and I just drove across the country for a month and reported on people?" And they said, "We'll try it out." Now he was slick. He did it for thirty years. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> he never came back. He was great. I think he had a plan. He had a plan, and he just went and he met people, and he talked to average people who showed that peppered throughout this country are great people that we don't know about. And that's part of my inspiration for that, that and Studs Turkel and his working book and everything. But he would he would um he would interview people and uh and uh uh I think I think Walter Cronkite when he retired said that uh uh Charles Corralt's first story was his best one and it was downhill from there for <laughs> thirty years. And it was kind of, uh, it w- but it was, it was stories about real people. It was stories about somebody who would uh, who would rebuild bikes in his town because he didn't have a bike when he grew up. He thought every kid should have a bike, mm-hmm. or or uh, real human stuff. Real human stuff of a family of uh, two, uh, a sharecropper who sent twelve kids to college, you know, and they all got doctorates, you know, 
and it was just it was an amazing it's an amazing amalgam of what this country is about and it's not black white it's not rich poor it's it's not any religion uh it's not any party it's just people and you know the one race is humanity you know mm-hmm. and uh, religion should be kindness or some variation of that and i know that's a, i'm not that much of a hippie but you get older it happens a little bit well if uh, not if not kindness then how about how about balance you know balance. F- for instance if 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 i told you like you could be a really really like m- my mom for instance is uh an incredibly devoted faithful christian woman and i don't care you know I don't care what you would say to her, what evidence you would present to her. And it's not because she's thick headed or stubborn. She believes to such a deep level in what she believes that you're not changing her mind. She's got a hundred percent faith. Right. But imagine if you told a person, okay, I need you to explain to me how we can be, how we can live a moral life, but you're not allowed to use God. You're not allowed to use religion. You're not allowed to use a book that already tells you how to do it. And you tell me, where would you even start? Okay, I can't use any of the things that pretty much the entire world bases their their moral direction on. You have to use something else. So for me, it came back to what do I see out there in the universe that, that okay, I, I can't, like, this can't be wrong because this is the overarching reality that has been around since before any of these religions. The sky is the sky. The cosmos is the cosmos. And one thing you see there is you see order over time, the formation of natural laws. You see bodies behaving in a certain way. Okay, So to me, what, what I ended up writing my thesis on um, to finish up school was how you could develop an ethic based on balance. And depending on what circumstance you found yourself in, that could make many, many typical things that you would find immoral, war, uh, violence, things like that, in a certain situation, in a certain time, it could be the moral path. If such a strong reaction to tyranny is needed to achieve balance once again, you might find you could justify an incredible amount of violent acts. You also could, when someone is screaming and yelling and being that, 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 that uh, dominating figure trying to push whatever the message was out to the public, you need that calmer voice to come in and, and make people think once again. It is about balance. The right course is always what brings us back to a center point, what brings us back to a balance point. And if you couldn't use anything else to base your moral life on, to me, the only thing I could come up with that made any sense, and w- which I found random philosophers from East and West, separated by thousands of years, were talking about this, that it really was the key to things. So if you ever, you know, wind up in the insane asylum and you have unlimited reading time, I'm going to give you that thesis so you can check it out. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend, it's not recommended reading, and I wrote it. I'm in the insane asylum on a regular basis, as you know. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. As you know, being... You, you are a guy who knows all about the insane asylum. Being out is rarer than being in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it's because where my office is. <laughs> <laughs> but but clearly back back to what you were saying about that that human that the real stuff of life that's clearly that's clearly something that you've built unsung based on yeah you know, here you I'm are trying. talking to me and uh, you you've talked to firefighters district attorneys all different kinds of people you you talk to everybody that sounds a lot like this gentleman you had mentioned with the Winnebago who I wasn't familiar with but I will check out now I, I think everybody has a story and I think that. Um uh, I think everybody has a story, and I think uh, it's the journalist, correspondent, whatever you want to call the person in the role. It's their job to mine that story out of them. And uh, and it's like one of the things I liked about Charles Corral was that he was a magnificently flawed man. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't his job to be good man or personality or role model was his job to present a good story and i Mm -hmm. think that we now look to the wrong people as role models you know we think that a a celebrity should be a role model and uh i think it was charles barkley who i don't know that i agree with him on a lot of things but somebody said you're not a great role model for my kid and he said you're supposed to be a role model for your kid, not me. Right. He never claimed to be that. <laughs> and he put in some curse words after that, but he made his point, and it right. was a valid point. And, and they need to have, uh, I mean, people need to put, you know, posters of uh, 
Einstein on their wall instead of musicians that are, are that are not going to be around in a couple of years or so, whatever because they do something else. It's or, crazy you just said that because mm-hmm. in my dining room, I have a picture. It's one of these like ones you get at Spencer Gifts or a thr- you know a, yeah. a, a novelty shop. I've got John Lennon in the um, watching the wheels uh, session right next to a picture of Einstein. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's actually on my dining room wall. Yeah, and I've got like uh, I've I've got like. But but see they pass the test of time in a way and you don't see them, they they remind you that it's nostalgia. You're talking like teen beat. I'm talking movie about po- or music posters, yeah, teen idols. Yeah, and and uh, like like uh, what did I ha- I had uh, I had Einstein and uh, and Bogart, uh, and Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones. That's a good mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, uh, my, my my thing was always, uh, you know, if I run everything through the filter of what my father, the Lone Ranger, and Curly would do, I would come up with a, uh, with a good solution. <laughs> if I like, ran it through that, you're talking filter, about Curly Howard. Curly Howard. Okay. Because <laughs> there's got to be a little humor in it. You <laughs> right, know? right, right, right. <laughs> you know. Well, you meant Curly the Stooge. That is Curly yeah, Howard. That's Curly Howard. That's the Curly Stooge. Howard. The uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, more more pe- more people need to be hit with pies. I think. I think. <laughs> I think uh, Maybe not take ourselves so seriously. I had a, I had a friend that went to. Uh, they used to have a. They still do. I think they have a, a, a Three Stooge convention, <laughs> and it ends with a big pie fight at the end. That sounds amazing. He asked me to go, and I didn't go, and he died not long after that, and I regretted uh. it uh, because. Uh, I said, I'm not going to hit somebody with a pie. And he said, when you get smacked in the face with a pie, you will throw a pie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's, you know, and, it, it, and I regret, you know, it's uh, – uh, uh, Charles Corral tells a story about a guy who was very elderly and he would take people on these uh, wilderness uh, canoeing trips and he kept writing Charles Corral and saying, come, come back up. We'll go on a trip. We'll see all the lakes. I won't charge you, blah, blah, blah. I enjoy your company. And he, and he didn't go. And he, uh, and he, he said that he, got a, he, he checked back in and found out the man had died. And he said, I can remember to the day I die, I'll remember not going back and doing that with him. But I can't remember what I was doing that was more important than seeing him. And that's very that's important. That's really important to think about. It's very important. He, he did this great thing where he uh, he uh, retired and he wanted to spend uh, – he picked 12 places that – favorite places and the favorite time of year to go there, and he wrote a book about it. Uh, you know, New Orleans in February and New York in December for Christmas and lights he did all stuff and his father died in the middle which changed all his plans and then and then he died but it just it just taught you that uh, the people that you see presented before you on the screens or on these different mediums these 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 so-called celebrities they they should not be your moral uh your moral compass no uh, and, and actually that mark you asked me right at the beginning of the of the um of the broadcast what is philosophy? And it dovetails beautifully with what you're talking about right now because philosophy, if I had to break it down to a one-line definition, it's asking questions about your reality and thinking about the ramifications of those questions in the service of asking deeper and better questions. That is philosophy. If you are um, not if you are not thinking right now, if you're not doing your own thinking, anyone listening to this, if you are not the one doing your thinking, but your family tradition is putting those words in your mouth, or the commentator that you are entertained by is putting those words in your mouth, or the latest vapid, brainless, idiot celebrity is putting those words in your mouth, you take a step back and think, when's the last time I truly thought about something? When's the last time I really thought deeply and didn't just accept that, oh, well, this was an offshoot of what I was taught as a kid, or this is an offshoot of what my teacher told me, or this is an offshoot of what my priest told me, or whatever. This is what society has been telling me. When's the last time you thought for yourself and determined what is the best way forward? What is the moral way? And not just in morality, but why are we here? 
Okay, one of the things that drove me to be an author, I think, is that I had an intrinsic knowledge of, under, uh, of understanding that 